Good afternoon, friends. Uh, today we are going to uh, discuss uh, India-Australia relations, and this uh, topic of discussion is particularly uh, useful uh, for the students of uh, PDP Bachelor Degree Program, those who are studying Government and Politics uh, Australia course. Uh, I'm sure that some of you who are uh, uh, listening to us and uh, sitting in their regional center and study center uh, watching our program, I request you uh, during the course of our discussion, uh, please ask questions so that uh, we will be able to clarify your doubts on various points that me and uh, uh, my friend Professor Chintamani Mahapatra, the School of International study JNU is with us and uh, he will be able to uh, clarify and at the same time uh, this particular uh, discussion was held uh, uh, almost uh, more than about eight months back if you recall that the focus was only on post Cold War international relations but today we will have a very broad general framework uh, discussion on India study relations. Uh, Professor Mahapatra, uh, if I am to say very, uh, you know, uh, in an introductory remark, as far as our uh, relations with Australia is concerned, uh, goes back uh, even during our freedom struggle. Uh, but Australia was part of the British uh, uh, Empire and uh, British mainly population and uh, Subsequently, you know, the, during freedom movement and subsequently India uh, became independent and after uh, we became independent, our relations with Australia was not very cordial in the sense uh, that, you know, uh, uh, when we became independent, our uh, main objectives, of course, foreign policy is to guard our own interest in terms of uh, national sovereignty, territorial integrity and uh, uh, economic uh, advancement. But very interestingly uh, that uh, the India became independent uh, and in the region also many countries became independent, things changed. In terms of uh, uh, the, uh, because British ruled the entire subcontinent for long and uh, India being a uh, leading country and a big country in the subcontinent, our top priority was to look for friends and uh, have uh, uh, a strong uh, foundations of friendship because our priority was mainly to build our national economy and also build a strong India. In that context, uh, uh, suppose if we see that, you know, the ideologically uh, India was uh, uh, opposed to the imperialism and uh, Australia part of the imperialist powers and then uh, India uh, became uh, friendly with the, those countries who were struggling against, uh, uh, fighting against the imperialist powers and uh, uh, definitely India's priority was to uh, support also struggles elsewhere in uh, Africa, Latin America and uh, uh, here uh, India played very important role that some of the basically socialist countries and uh, uh, particularly the Soviet Union we had you know the very good relation whereas you know with this uh, arrangement so immediately after the you know the war so the Cold War phase uh, Soviet Union and America they had many divergent views and Australia and India India was uh, uh, immediately a country looking for partners and we choose uh, Russia. But in the subsequent, you know, uh, years, there are many changes they have taken place as far as, you know, because what happens in America or Soviet Union, they have definitely affected uh, to our relations of concern between India and Australia relations, whether it is uh, India raising wise against uh, the, you know, the racism in Africa, like apartheid, or India wising concern on the issue of, uh, you know, America giving arms to uh, Pakistan or forging relations because like we became independent, we were looking for partners 
similarly for infrastructure development security military so this was you know the agenda of you know other countries in the region particularly pakistan but anything happened that the you know to uh, superpowers definitely it has affected to uh, both uh, india and australia uh, uh, with this you know uh, a brief introduction i'll uh, stop here and request you to react further uh, i'll just add on uh, to whatever you said professor gopal and try to put in perspective why the relationship between india and australia was like the one you said now once india became independent in 1947 it found that world war 2 was over and the two countries in the world had emerged for the first time in global history as superpowers one was the citadel of capitalism and the other one was a very powerful communist country as the ideological tussle between the two began and took the form of what is known as the cold war then india and australia found uh, two different ways of approaching the cold war australia thought that after world war 2 the best way to safeguard its interest uh, economic political as well as security would be to look for a powerful ally outside who could underwrite australian security in case there was a danger for as india thought the whole idea was not to look for an external guarantee for its security but to try to be befriend the countries on both the side of the cold war divide and this policy this positive policy came to be known as non alignment so this alignment versus non alignment as the primary uh, security uh, policy uh, you know uh, actually created problem for india and australia to come together uh, in maintaining uh, peace and stability because the approaches were different having said that it is important that india uh, did not ignore australia's interest even before becoming independent india convened an asian relations conference and invited australia as uh, an observer in asian relations conference articulating that australia uh, although it is white is part of asia and to maintain peace and stability in asia australia's cooperation would be necessary this is very very important number 2 uh, australia joined the american alliance system Uh, both in terms of signing a trilateral agreement called ANZUS Australia New Zealand and USA and another multilateral organization known as Southeast Asia Treaty Organization CETO CETO India did not have much to complain about uh, ANZUS because that was a trilateral uh, organization consisting of just three countries Australia New Zealand and USA but when it came to CETO India found that uh, is relatively smaller country in south asia which looked at india as an inimical country also became part of cito in the process australia and india's number one adversary in the 1950s were together in a security alliance whereas pandit nehru was tumtuming the whole idea of non alignment and global peace and decolonization and anti imperialism and etc et so that that created another problem Mm. as and when the cold war hotspots emerged uh, but don't you think that you know um, sorry for interrupting but don't you think that well uh, india invited uh, australia uh, minority christian white <laughs> country uh, right in the you know the indian subcontinent in the indian ocean it is fine uh, australia was invited and uh, it was also top priority as a you know independent nation and uh, jawahar lal nehru the first prime minister of india who never visited australia and there was no occasion for even the prime minister to visit because as i said very rightly in the beginning that our uh, foreign policy postures were largely directed against the imperialist powers because australia was part of the you know um uh, the uh, imperialist alliance system 
What is important here is that, you know, the, we invited Australia for Asian Relations Conference, but after uh, that, uh, India never took any initiative for subsequent uh, political uh, uh, firm foundations as far as, you know, the inviting, uh, I mean, that time, you know, ASEAN was not there, SARC was not there, there was nothing, but India had a role to play. But our main concern and uh, uh, the emphasis was largely on uh, non-alignment. Absolutely, but there is a reason behind it. To maintain equidistance yeah. from both the... Yeah. Uh, there are two, three reasons behind of why it happened the way it happened. Number one was personality class. Whereas Pandit Nehru was a Fabian socialist, and his way of looking at world affairs was different. Uh, Menges, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia. Yeah, uh, um, uh, Fraser? Yeah. yeah. Now, it, Australia had a policy of uh, white Australia. Uh, they did not encourage immigration from other Asian countries. They Achha, white, atri white atri Australia uh, white policy. Only, white, yeah. white Australia policy. Yeah. And uh, uh, Australian leadership considered the country to be an extension of Western culture a, into geographical Asia. Whereas Nehru was articulating the need for an Asian cooperative mechanism uh, in the midst of the Cold War so that Asians would not become dependent on Western imperialist powers. Australia was looking at itself as part of the Western culture. Not part of Asia. Not part of Asia. And uh, not only that, while Australia and India both were British colonies, in Australia, it was actually uh, white men ruling over white men. Well, yeah, yeah. Whereas, in other parts of the world, it, it was not so. Australia, in a way, was similar to the United States, which was also a British colony at one time. Absolutely. Now, right. because, because of this cultural and political and personality factor, mm -hmm. as Australia was uh, involved in US-led or US-sponsored regional groupings, Nehru was talking about an Asian regional grouping where the Western powers had no role. It had to be indigenous Asian way of solving Asian problem. That is why, soon after Asian Relations Conference, incidentally, even the United States participated in the Asian Relations Conference as an observer. observer. So, soon after that, as the Cold War unfolded, beginning with three years of warfare in Korean Peninsula, and soon after that, the Indochina crisis for another 20 years, Australia practically <coughs> sided with the United States of America. Whereas India was trying to steer clear of the alliances and take the middle path. That is why, you know, this kind of political differences, largely on two major Asian events, three years of Korean War and 20 years of, uh, you know, Indochina crisis, which put Australia and India practically on the opposite side of the Cold War divide. And it so happened that in 1962, Nehru also understood the limitations of non-alignment when China attacked India. And Australia was very forthcoming in supporting India. So again, uh, the relationship, you know, which was before India became independent, it was not so inimical. It became slightly adversarial in the wake of the Cold War. But in the 1962, there was an opportunity where Australia and India could actually come together and Australia did help India. And Nehru did write a letter to the Australian Prime Minister seeking help. He wrote a letter to even Kennedy in the United States, you know. Mm -hmm. However, as Australia began to interfere in Kashmir affairs and try to resolve Kashmir issue, that created another political problem. As India kept, kept on telling, even now it keeps on telling, Kashmir is an internal affairs of India, we'll take care of it. No outside interference. Further, I'll add one very important point. You know, in 1962 war, when China attacked India, uh, Australians were very clever because immediately after uh, we became independent for long there was you know practically no uh, economic relations or there was no any investment as far as in and uh, India gradually led you know the firm foundations of planning and uh, it's uh, you know the world outlook international level was growing in there in the reason it was a major country when you compare Absolutely. smaller countries but Australia being you know the cunning country sitting there as very rightly said the white Christian uh, uh, living in Asia but propagating you know the Europe there so they took the opportunity of uh, uh, supporting India because it was by then a fairly well-developed economy 
Australia by uh, the 60s, it was a fairly well developed economy. And they had fairly well developed educational institutions. Mm. And the only irritant was like uh, even in the uh, 60s that white Australia policy, not allowing the non whites to enter the country. And there were other restrictions, mm. but that rigidity was very much there. Mm. But what is important is uh, if he, they looked at this, you know, when there was uh, Rush, uh, Soviet Union and uh, uh, China. So China was uh, threat to Australia uh, and then you know the Soviet Union was uh, very harsh towards the Chinese because uh, always they maintain very cordial relations with China not with India and when they were feeling threat mm. so China attacked then they extended mm. that you know immediately any threat to India is direct threat to on us and we condemn and they came in favor of uh, India. But you know nothing happened substantial as far as this was only you know uh, shedding crocodile tears. Uh, but uh, uh, further in terms of trade, in terms of uh, uh, deeper uh, uh, you see the people to people movement was with uh, Japan, uh, with China, with Korea but uh, after Nehru uh, death though some kind of diplomatic level uh, uh, environment was uh, created for exchange of, uh, you know, uh, the secretary level, but uh, immediately that was uh, uh, withdrawn after Nehru's death. It was only, you know, the Mrs. Gandhi uh, who made a visit, uh, this was in 1967, I must say, that was very uh, a remarkable uh, uh, beginning. But, you know, again, uh, uh, in the late 60s, India, the Mrs. Gandhi domestically was very busy in consolidating and at the same time our uh, Narayan movement was uh, in full swing and against the, you know, uh, superpower, uh, great power, uh, whatever you call it, but we were not uh, maintaining any military alliance, either of the superpowers maintaining distance, but that uh, uh, maybe beginning was made uh, some sort of you know the link uh, uh, economic uh, and trade relations with these countries. But subsequently, if you see that after uh, Mrs. Gandhi's visit 1967, there was a huge gap. But you know, Australian Prime Minister also visited, and then in 1973, uh, Gough White Lam uh, visited uh, India, uh, and. Uh, the trade was very marginal and there was nothing much, but the aid continued. Aid continued uh, very marginal. It was around 34 million to less than 100 million. Practically, there was nothing much between these two countries. And uh, sort of uh, aid was about 34, 50 million. So uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, end of it. But what is important is the turning point what I call it even one of the volumes I edited, uh, Australia India relations in the changing world. So it was I think only in 1984 uh, 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 exactly it was uh, the Rajiv Gandhi yeah. is, uh, visit to Australia. But let because me explain a little yeah. bit, you know, a very interesting point you made, why it happened the way it happened. Yeah. After Nehru's death in 1964 and Mrs. Gandhi's trip to Australia, a very significant development took place in South Asia. That was India-Pakistan War of 1965. During that war, although Australia and Pakistan were part of a strategic uh, regional security pact called mm. CETO, yeah. Australia did not come to the help of Pakistan directly. Australia maintained an official neutrality policy. Of course, the Australian policy was somewhat similar to the American policy. But the fact remains that Australia did not take any action that could have been interpreted as thoroughly adversarial by India. So that, that itself, in a way, uh, facilitated Mrs. Indira Gandhi's uh, uh, trip to Australia. If Australia would have taken the side of Pakistan, things would have been totally different. So this is a very interesting development. Then, six years later, that is about four years after Mrs. Gandhi visited Australia. Another significant development took place in South Asia. That was India-Pakistan War of 1971. 
again by the time australia doesn't appear to have made any uh, concrete uh, policy by which india could have been adversely affected during the 1971 war mm. although the american tilt towards pakistan was very clear americans knew the difficulties in indochina they had only planned to withdraw their troops from indochina australians had helped the americans by Wait, sending troops um, to indochina so when indochina was getting out of hand australia did not think uh, proper to get involved in another uh, problem in south asia so that kind of in a way hands up policy towards what happened in south asia also led to a change in perception between the australians and indians towards each other the reason why economic relationship trade investment relationship did not uh, take off the ground uh, either in the 50s or 60s or even subsequently for a long time it was because india keeping in mind the large size of the country and the large population in the country and the demographic burden of uh, poverty and backwardness adopted a policy uh, which came to be regarded as a socialistic pattern of society a kind of mixed economy where the government played considerable role in regulating india's economy private sector as well as promoting the public sector mm -hmm. for example australia uh, was almost a free market economy by and large and that is why there was no meeting of minds between the two so one was uh, the relationship with australia uh, australia and usa india and usa was different and secondly the pakistan factor and in the backdrop of this when the when the economic system uh, in india and australia were different it is very difficult for australians and indians to do too much of trade and investment uh, between one another and then of course uh, you you came to 1986 where rajiv gandhi made a very important uh, visit to australia again timing was important again in 1986 rajiv gandhi also visited the united states and that time the afghanistan crisis was changing soviet union was getting stuck in afghanistan the way the americans were stuck in into china gorbachev phenomenon had uh, already appeared in soviet union there was restructuring perestroika and glasnost in soviet union and india expected that this kind of changing policy in the soviet union would of course uh, lead to considerable uh, impact upon indo soviet ties it could not be uh, granite gran 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 strong or solid as it was during the cold war time which by incidentally even australians did not like india and soviet union coming together uh, since 71 but when reagan uh, took a different look at rajiv gandhi a young man very dynamic uh and uh, a person who is a technocrat who was talking about lifting india and pushing it into the 21st century such a dynamic man engaged him and cut off this close relationship between soviet union and india australia also showed interest yes why not team up with the us and make india a friend so india should not be too close to the main adversary soviet union in any case they are facing problem in afghanistan already iron is hot strike at that moment rajiv gandhi visits australia in 1986 the very important what you said was uh, but suddenly you know this glass nose and prestorika of uh, michael gorbachev uh, gave some kind of you know the signal that some changes are going to take place and changes as very rightly you said that it will affect not only india but also to the uh, you know soviet union uh, other part of the world but definitely if you see that uh, uh, soviet union and uh, american treaty leading a uh, peace treaty and leading to dumping of their nuclear arms uh, some of these very important events it is fine but what is important is that you know are still in alliance with the usa you know yeah, indian prime minister rajiv gandhi goes to america it had impact because whatever happens in america with india quickly they have you see uh, attitude but they have not shut this you know the uh, even it was also true during nehru's time uh, he uh, also termed that australia is a stooge of uh, uh, america but even today also uh, if you see uh, the the way uh, they react on various developments uh, whenever uh, we have uh, at the international level our equation with america 
and Australia reacts. But uh, my uh, strong opposition is that uh, uh, in the Cold War time, because it is very important to understand that uh, USA supported Pakistan with arms and ammunition, even for you know infrastructure development. And uh, you've been exposed on uh, America's foreign policy, and you are speaking very. Uh, extensively on this subject, but uh, anti-India position, you know, the <coughs> Australia, they also had anti-India as far as issue of Kashmir is concerned. So America, but gradually with the changes they have taken place after Rajiv Gandhi's visit and subsequently, both these, you know, the uh, partners, they have changed their colors. Well, how do you react to this? You know, uh, as I said, Australia, uh, like it or not, has been a junior partner of the United States. Australia always looks at the clock in Washington, D.C., the diplomatic clock, and adjusts its reaction and responses to world events on the basis of uh, the American move. So, as, as, as you yourself pointed out, whenever the U.S. takes a different look at India, Australian perception also changes accordingly. Every time an American president has visited India, either in a few months' time or in a few weeks' time, an Australian PM visited India. And when uh, Rajiv Gandhi went to Australia, he also went to the United States of America. So that means we have to take note that very strong connection to Washington, D.C., Canberra and New Delhi's temperature in the relationship, by and large, were guided by what happened in Washington, D.C. Mm. So that is why it is a very, very important point. Having said that, another critical factor that affected the relationship between India and Australia throughout the Cold War and to a large extent spilled over into post-Cold War era is the nuclear factor. For Australia, which is very rich in uranium deposit, and Australia which is technically so advanced, and Australia which felt that if it wanted to, it could have become a nuclear weapon power, but could not become so because of American pressure could not tolerate a country like India with millions of poor people Are you sure that Australia, the nuclear muscle. Australia has no nuclear power? Australia doesn't have a nuclear weapon uh, program of its own. Australia is under American nuclear umbrella. American nuclear weapons are suspected to be stationed in some of the Australian facilities. Australia allows the movement of American ships carrying nuclear weapons. So it is very protected already. It has an umbrella. India doesn't have. But at the same time, these Australians could not tolerate a country like India, which is otherwise poverty-stricken and backward, quote-unquote, so many uh, adjectives are used against India, suddenly flexing its muscle to an extent where it emerges as a nuclear weapon uh, country. Uh, initially, in 1974, a nuclear-capable country. And since 1998, a nuclear weapon country. And Australians, I don't know whether they're jealous, they're envy, or, or what. I understand that in principle, Australia follows a policy uh, of non-proliferation. Australians tend to think that their policy is just and fair, which we don't think so, because just now I said they are under American nuclear umbrella. That is why they could uh, adopt a policy like that. They did not appreciate the compulsions, the strategic calculations that went into India's decision to go nuclear. They always branded India as one of the proliferators. But India was not a proliferator the way Pakistan has been, mm. the way China was, uh, the way Libya tried to, the way Ahmadinejad is uh, in involved in a shouting match with uh, George Bush. India has never been like that, but Australians failed to understand. And partly because of these political divergences, and lack of adequate economic relationship, there was hardly a serious dialogue between the Australian foreign policy community and the Indian foreign policy community, either at track two level or at track one level. That is why the misunderstanding, which continued until very recently. And in fact, uh, mm, I want to admire your effort to promote Australian studies in India and hold uh, this kind of uh, conferences uh, in different parts of uh, India, bringing in a team of Australians talking to them, dialoguing them, trying to convince them that, look, you guys got to understand India. You cannot develop an understanding of India by sitting in your rooms in Canberra and Sydney uh, and writing papers. Come, we are the Indians. Talk to us. What forced us 
induced us to go nuclear. You know. You very rightly said, but you know the very important thing I just uh, want to point out uh, again to draw your attention. Uh, Rajiv Gandhi's visit and subsequently, you know, Glasnost and you know, Prasthrika were talking. And in 1989, the developments that was, uh, you know, leading to disintegration of, you know, former Soviet Union. So practically, this has, you know, with the end of Cold War. Yeah. Suppose if you say that, you know, Soviet intervened in Afghanistan, you just cited that example. They were there, and tensions have grown after Soviet intervened in Afghanistan. But with the uh, uh, Michael Gorbachev becoming president and then uh, this policy of Prastraika Glasnost, so he wanted to change the very the basic foundations of you know the structure of the you know the Soviet uh, union. Uh, union and uh, I mean it was you know I consider that uh, that was one of the biggest event in the history of international relations and that led to uh, end of uh, Cold War. So now coming to the post Cold War, what are those you know the important events at the international level? There are many things. Uh, we don't want to go into the details how this happened but definitely some of these things have also contributed for India, a smaller country like you know like India, Australia, they are uh, what you call is the emerging uh, economies. As, uh, India is emerging economy, but Australia is already a developed economy, a middle power you call it. So, uh, after Soviet Union uh, disintegration, India lost its you know the market and everything uh, practically wiped off. So we had no any such uh, larger level like we had you know with Soviet Union. Eastern European nations. Some of these things, you know, are very important. So uh, we call, you know, changing nature of, you know, relations in terms of our looking at uh, political relations, strategic relations, or economic relations at the international level. And here it becomes very uh, essential for India, being a largest democracy, a country with, uh, you know, almost 100 crore population has to think uh, uh, for new partners, new alliances. And this is where, uh, uh, while changes are taking place, we look to, to the new partners for our economic cooperation. And uh, with the new government coming in in 1991, introduction of uh, uh, Lukist policy by the prime, late Prime Minister Nasinga Rao. So, uh, this is one of the, you know, the important, uh, the, uh, the beginning, I must say. Not foundation, the beginning, but subsequent many developments have taken place. So, uh, you elaborate on this first. Yeah. Let me elaborate a little bit on this very important point that you made. You know, by late 1980s, the Cold War was considerably winding down. The Afghan Accord was signed by which Gorbachev agreed to withdraw all the Soviet troops from Afghanistan. In 1987, uh, the INF Accord was uh, signed between the Americans and the Soviets, which was uh, the first ever concrete move towards nuclear arms control. And both the sides agreed to uh, close down their uh, intermediate range missile facilities uh, in the whole of Europe. As the Cold War was winding down, and India was already watching very carefully, very intensively what was happening within the domestic politics of the Soviet Union, India was also making its own move to systematically, though slowly, improve relationship with the United States of America. Six months before the Soviet Union collapsed like a house of cards, let me tell you, nobody around the world expected the Soviet Union to, dis to disintegrate like a house of cards. You know, thousands of nuclear weapons could not protect the territorial integrity of the Soviet Union. So, what was the use of those military? The, the other dynamic forces were at work, which, uh, which led to the collapse of the Soviet system. Six months before that happened, the same Prime Minister that you mentioned had employed a gentleman uh, whose name is Dr. Manmohan Singh. The, foreign minister, the Prime Minister today was the Finance Minister that time. 
and finance minister Dr. Manmohan Singh began a mini economic revolution in India in June 1991, economic liberalization policy. That policy struck the minds of the American businessmen and traders. And they looked at India, which was, and they did not look at the semi side of life in India, the poverty stricken Indians, uh, the cows and the elephants in the street. What they looked at India is a hugely and rapidly growing economic middle powerhouse, class, middle class, and a potential economic powerhouse. And when the Commerce Department brought out a report and called India one of the 10 big emerging markets, then most of the traders and businessmen from the developed world, including Australia, they got a wake-up call. Look, 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 a country is coming up in South Asia in a very big way and the middle class is expanding like anything. Huge market. Now, again, just to quote you when you, when you said, Narasimha Rao, keeping in mind uh, the necessity for economic liberalization, making India join the international market force, he adopted a policy of you know, look east. The look east means the Asia Pacific region, which was a vibrant uh, market in Asia, which was almost uh, threatening uh, the Western industri industrial nations that they would uh, take the highest port, you know, hi hi highest place in the global uh, share of wealth. He thought the best way to implement this new economic policy would be. Uh, um, look east policy. Australia at that time adopted a policy of look west. When Australians look west, they look at India. <laughs> and when, when India looks east, it looks at Australia and Southeast Asia. So both Canberra and New Delhi were getting ready to take a new look at each other. Soviet Union, a consistent irritant in the relationship between India and the US and India and Australia was no longer existing. India said goodbye to the license Raj, said goodbye to the socialistic pattern of growth and was uh, gradually getting into the international marketplace. And that clicked and even the Australians took a deeper look at the growing India and began to engage India in a serious dialogue in the 1990s, early 1990s. Uh, that dialogue led to to form a uh, India Australia Business Council, and then followed by Australia India Council. Absolutely. Because uh, uh, the business delegation visited India, and Indian business delegation visited uh, uh, Australia. The mutually, two partners started uh, uh, working towards strengthening their economies. But the huge investment came after India Business, uh, India Australia Business Council was established. But the large number of Australian companies, including IT, so they came to India, and large number of you know the Indian companies also have invested in Australia. This led to the you know the beginning for the first time. Suppose we discussed about the you know uh, a briefly historical period even prior to India becoming independent and so. India be after became independent, so not very cordial relations, there is nothing much. Because this I am uh, uh, briefly explaining for the benefit of students that, you know, even in the 60s, practically nothing, but that was Mrs. Gandhi, first uh, Prime Minister of India who visited, and then in the 1970s, we have the, you know, uh, witness as far as, you know, if uh, 1962, uh, India, China war is the witness, and then 73, the example you gave on the war. What is important is now uh, both economy. You see, the Australia is basically a capitalist country. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So we call it in India, you know, the Banias. So basically, they are into business, and uh, India. For long it was socialist, very ideal, you know, non-alignment. Everything is gone. Because if you are not conducting business, Professor Mahapatra, you cannot ignore the, you know, the economic uh, dynamism and then only you promote idealism. Because you have today 1000 million population, I mean, uh, with 
many many problems it's just not india but uh, not australia but many countries we have to have larger economic cooperation so australia becomes one of the you know the important you know partner and some of these you know the joint business council and australia india council so india australia council in india was also formed so mutual both the partners started working and gradually if you see in the 90s there was hardly about less than 3 billion dollars of trade between these two countries but now the concentration australian uh, the investment in mining is there in uh, bihar they have you know the strong educational linkages with tamil nadu they have also with karnataka and uh, southern part of india they have moved very fast and uh, if you see that uh, some of these things have uh, contributed definitely uh, mutually to both the countries but uh, what is important is that india while playing important role and then india was looking for or uh, you know uh, to build its uh, uh, military uh, stronger in 1998 uh, the nuclear explosion this are you know 90 so that was also a setback as far as uh, southern uh, australians uh, withdrawing that uh, but before, military but before the setback let me let me add uh, one piece of information just to link up our uh, Uh, discussion and this piece of information uh, one may not find in books or articles uh, because uh, this is this is what happened right in front of my nose and subsequently you know what happened in 1990 in 1992 narasimha rao talked about locust in 1993 the australians talked about locust in 1994 first ever security dialogue between a visiting team of australians uh, to new delhi took place Where I was this was working, in where, where? Uh, in New Delhi. Huh. I was part of uh, the Institute for Defence Studies Analysis, and I in incidentally presented a paper on the America factor there in 1994. And around this time, this Australia-India Council had been set up. Yeah, it was and set up in 1994. And the momentum began from then on. We took the initiative and established uh, this uh, um, Australian Studies uh, Association in India. 2000. And all these important developments. contributed to the growth of relationship at least at the people to people level between india and australia very important and in 1995 another important thing took place that was the indian ocean rim association rim association professor mahapatra thank you very much uh, very important uh, uh, you know uh, issues uh, we have discussed and uh, you have made a very significant contribution and uh, Uh, what is important is that uh, uh, we friends we need further to discuss 1998 and subsequent development especially with a focus on india australia uh, nuclear issue and then uh, if you take the you know other developments which have taken place uh, now australia has a new government and there are number of new initiatives between india and australia definitely we will come again with a new topic for uh, further uh, to uh, take some of those uh, important uh, issues to our students and uh, once again to uh, 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 thanking you for uh, listening to our discussion and also uh, um, i thank on behalf of uh, ignu and on behalf of all of you to professor mahapatra for uh, such a wonderful contribution thank you very much uh,